And I am so happy to be here with uh, my guest today, uh, 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 Lauren Selig, that is today uh, in your, where today? Seattle. I'm in Seattle today. Seattle today. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to, to have you with us today because I, uh, Lauren spoke at several of our conferences. And, you know, one of the names I showed at my video that I really need to remake by now, and maybe you'll help me find the right person. I, I didn't even update it in, 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 in a year, is uh, Gina Diaz, who uh, I found to be very interesting because she was uh, growing to, uh, she, she's the next gen of a very prominent family that ended up doing her own thing and was very successful. And in that respect, I find you uh, similar. So you're... It, I think you, you both should know each other. So just a couple of words. Awesome. And it's really, I mean, you've done so much from crypto to film to so many things. So Lauren is an entrepreneur and executive producer with a 20 year track record of global impact in media, real estate and startups. Uh, through her self-made production company, Shake and Bake, she has uh, produced award-winning films uh, like Hexel Ridge, and Lone Survivor, as well as other films like uh, Parkland, Crawl, American Made, and many, many more. Uh, and at the same time, through her other company, uh, Valis Studios, uh, she created the Facebook 360 Studio. She produced Intel's uh, Smithsonian American Virtual Reality Experience, and she won an Emmy for the first Virtual Reality Summit of a Mount Everest. And that's just a little bit of what you've done. And, and by the way, we had amazing folks from the film world, from the Russo brothers uh, that did Captain America, uh, from uh, Nancy Spielberg uh, uh, and, and many others. So uh, it's, it's really um, an interesting world for me. I love films and, and, and entertainment and all of that. So um, yeah, so first of all, uh, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you guys for joining. I appreciate it. This will be a fun little session. I'll do my very best to kind of cover whatever I think you guys are interested in and feel free to ask uh, questions along the way or if you prefer to save it to the end, Denny, I leave that up to you. Um, sorry for the noise in the background. Our lovely neighbors are building their new house, um, which is actually kind of part of our story, which is pretty funny. But um, do you want me to just dive right in and talk a little bit about how I got to where I am and what I do and go from here. And um, so first of all, uh, you know, I had uh, Paul Desmarais, a very known family in Canada, speaking at our Vancouver conference. And the first thing he said, I don't want to be called the next gen. I don't understand why they call me the next gen. The fact that my grandpa built one of the largest companies in Canada is great, but I did my own thing and I've done whatever it is I've done. But you know, this is, this is something, uh, uh, that that is uh, uh, part of his life and part of your life and and what I mentioned to you when we spoke before that was interesting is that you could have you could have had a very comfortable life doing being involved in your father's business we'll talk about it in a second and yet uh, I believe unlike your siblings you're the one that decided to do her own thing and you did it very very well and in, in, in different sectors so your background you, your father, uh, Martin Sally, uh, uh, one of the major names in America in real estate. Maybe I'll start, you know, at the start. How was yeah. it to be born there? How was life? How was, and I know you worked at the family business as well. We'll get to that as well. But maybe we'll start there at your childhood, at, at, at what made you be what you are today. Yeah. The fact that you chose a different route. So. I was going to try to share a slideshow with me. For some reason, it's not allowing me to share. But uh, I have a funny photo of my brother and I when we were very little. I was probably three or four years old, and he was a few years older than, than I was. And we were in the construction pit of a building that my dad was building at the time. I think he always uh, assumed that his kids were destined to go into real estate. My first job was actually washing the windows off the side of a 76-story building. I was probably 10 at the time. I thought that was pretty cool. I was making, you know, four bucks an hour at that. And uh, <laughs> I always spent my lunch money on that. And then I ended up with nothing and realized very quickly how hard it was to make a dollar. Um, 
I was born in Seattle, Washington. Uh, my father was born in Germany, fled during the war with two gold coins, the sole of his shoe. Um, I have one of them, my sister has the other one. Uh, and he came to the US with really nothing um, during the war and started his company truly almost by accident. He thought he was gonna go to law school and uh, he got rejected from every law school that he applied to except for Stanford. And a few weeks later, they uh, emailed, or sorry, they called email. It's so funny how I think that happened back then. They called him and said, we're very sorry, but um, we sent you the wrong letter. And unfortunately you'll fail if you come here. So we think it's best that you kind of go your merry way and not come to Stanford. Anyway, he uh, ended up buying a building for a couple thousand dollars and flipped it uh, a few weeks later for double his money. And he thought maybe I should go into real estate. So that's how he started his business. Um, I actually thought uh, in the beginning of my career, I was going to go into the uh, sort of Christiana Amanpour arena. I wanted to go into politics. I thought that was kind of my politics meets uh, journalism brain that I wanted to put on. Um, so that's where I kind of started my world. So I ended up at Georgetown and, and one of my summers, uh, or actually one of my Christmas breaks, I met um, someone who made a bet with me. Uh, and he said, I, I bet you that my name ends up in Variety before yours. And it's funny because I didn't really know what Variety was at the time. I just kind of wanted to win the bet. And uh, that following year, I ended up in London, going to London School of Economics while I was in college. And I was walking down Soho and I walked by the um, I walked by the offices of Variety and I saw the name on the on the mantle and I thought there's just no way I can ignore this uh, this sign. I literally walked in off the street and I asked for a job. Um, and they gave me the job, which was kind of strange. I had done some writing the year prior at Ski Magazine and they said, you know, go for it, write. So I ended up with my name uh, in an article writing about a Michael Winterbottom film. And my friend Jason uh, made good on his bet. Uh, the win was that he got me a job in LA and I ended up moving for a summer and worked uh, at DreamWorks for Mark Johnson who made Donnie Brasco and Rain Man and Good Morning Vietnam. Um, and Jason and I are, are great friends uh, to this day. In fact, uh, you know, I ended up in, actually let me go backwards in time. After DreamWorks, I ended up going off uh, to law and business school and out the back end of it ended up at Microsoft um, doing tech acquisitions for them. So I had my entertainment background, had my, you know, tech background, um, both of which were, you know, interesting, but I still didn't feel like I was kind of getting what I wanted to out of life. And uh, at that point, I was living in Seattle. I had met my uh, husband at the time, who was Bill Gates's uh, technical advisor and ran high performance computing for Microsoft. Um, I uh, decided to join the family business working for my dad. I think it was a little bit of Jewish guilt and uh, went to go work for my dad for about six years um, in the real estate business uh, in Seattle, Washington. And um, in May of 2012, uh, some friends of mine invited me to Cannes. They said, you have to come. It'll be really fun. And I really missed the entertainment business. So I went for a week. I thought it was you know, an incredible opportunity. And in the back of my mind, I'd always thought that I'd go back in the entertainment industry if I could just sort of figure out my way of doing that without sort of uh, having it scoff the family business and create a problem for my dad. And then uh, I landed back in Seattle, May of 2012. And assuming I would tell my husband, you know, I want to go back in the entertainment industry, let's figure out a way of making it work. Um, and cut to, you know, the sad part of the story is my husband passed away the day that I landed back in Seattle. So my life did a very big pivot on that day uh, for good and for bad. Obviously, the bad part was that I lost my husband. We had to have two little children. I had two little children at the time. They're now big children. Um, and I ended up the next day waking up and walking into my dad's office and saying, I quit. I never want to do anything I don't love again. Um, I'm going to go do something totally different with my life. And it, I had had the rug pulled out from underneath me. And in a good way, I decided I was going to do something totally different with my life. Um, How old were your kids at the time? My kids were three and six. Wow. So you're on your own, three and six. Three and six. And uh, I just thought this is the most ridiculous thing I could have ever experienced. 
I had actually, while I was in Cannes, uh, randomly met somebody who said, you've got to go make this movie. And when I had come back to Seattle, I thought this is a movie that I really want to make. I hadn't been making movies at the time, but I thought it was a great story um, actually about someone who I knew uh, from Georgetown and I had wanted to move forward on that. So here I am three days later sitting in my kitchen, actually with my friend Jason, who had gotten me the job from DreamWorks. He had flown in uh, for the funeral and he said, you know what, you're coming to L.A. and uh, we're going to go make that movie. And that's literally what I did. So I moved to L.A. Um, the following year. That summer, I went on set and we made uh, Lone Survivor 2012. Um, and it was the first sort of Hollywood movie that I had really made out of coming out of nowhere and really having the rug pulled out from underneath me and having absolutely no idea what I wanted to do uh, with my life. Um, so that led to starting uh, Shake and Bake Productions. I moved to LA, I set up offices actually with Jason at the Paramount Studios lot. Um, he was working at the time with William Sherrick, whose dad was president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And off we went started making movies back to back. We made about 35 movies in five years. Uh, it was a little insane. You know, there, our movies were and are uh, Hacksaw Ridge, Lone Survivor, American Made, um, Rocket Man, a long list of really fun experiences and um, a lot of really great uh, lessons along the way. We made a lot of things um, in sci-fi, did a lot of um, work on military movies. Uh, the only one I made with Jason was actually Lone Survivor. After that, I ended up kind of going on my own and creating my own sort of vortex of film and television. Uh, random stories of, of movies that were made as a friend of mine called me and he said, listen, I'm out of money. I need to make this show. It has to be on the air within a few days. Otherwise, I lose the rights to it. I said, well, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. I said, but I'm in. Let's do it. So I wrote a check on a Hello Kitty checkbook and we made the first episode of Wheel of Time, which was absolutely horrible. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And uh, because we got it on the air really quickly, he ended up keeping the rights to Wheel of Time. Of course, it went to court, you know, went through many, many years of uh, legal machinations between the rights holders and between our group. We ended up winning. Um, I never thought I would make my money back. I never even thought twice about it. And then a few years later, I get a call saying, hey, by the way, Wheel of Time was picked up by Amazon and Sony. We're going to go and make the whole series. And now it was the number one series on Amazon last year, I think, and we're into uh, season two. So those are bizarre stories of how random things get made in my world that were never expected to be made. Um, we've done things in VR very early. We did the first March on Washington. We recreated Martin Luther King as an avatar. It was on the cover of Time magazine. A couple of years ago, won some Emmys for that. We sent a crew up Mount Everest. We shot the first VR summit of Mount Everest, which you can go and climb, um, which is super fun and something very different. We made the movie Everest as well alongside that. Um, randomly, I ended up going and running the IMAX VR fund as a result, which was a success and a disaster at the same time. It was about five years too early. They had $100 million in an account and said, we want to make X amount in X amount of time. I said, there's absolutely no way I can get you that return in that amount of time, given the market where it is right now. And I said, it take all, take all the money back. <laughs> I can't do it. But because of that, I met a lot of companies that I personally invested in and spent time with. And um, those companies have all done extremely well, which is kind of nice. I always uh, rib the IMAX folks for that a little bit. We stay friends uh, throughout this whole thing. I think learning curve in my brain is, you know, never burn a bridge, always keep your you know, whatever, whatever deal falls apart, there's always something great that will come out of it at a later point in time. I really do believe that because always these things come full circle. It's always literally always been that way. Um, many of the ideas and investments and things that my husband talked about, you know, before 2012 are all things that have come to fruition uh, today, which is actually incredibly exciting. Um, on the, the philanthropic side, uh, a friend of mine one day. Oh, wait, go ahead. Dan, you have a question. I don't know if you want to just me keep talking or feel free to ask questions along the way. I want to touch all of that. Is, uh, yeah. Before we touch philanthropy, there's so many questions about the film. Uh, first of all, um, you know, I know many families uh, that uh, Next Gen and others that love cinema and went to that, but they ended up doing crappy films. And, uh, <laughs> I made some crappy 
Bobby films. I made Bobby films. Yeah, but you made some pretty, you know, significant films uh, without any background. Yeah. In, 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 it's not that you've been in the film industry and you were born into it and you got it. You came out of a different world into this uh, very risky business, by the way. Everybody says, you know, film and yeah. art and Broadway are the probably, you cannot go more dangerous than that. And first of all, all in all, it was successful. How did you find the right projects? And all in all, your film career, is it a profitable business? Is it too risky business unless you are born into it? Or how do you see that, that world? You know, I always thought it was really odd when I first came in the industry, how many producers and directors don't fund their own movies. That's the weirdest thing. I thought, why, why are they not making their own capital contribution into their projects? And kind of the running joke was like, well, you don't make any money in the industry. So why would you want to fund your own projects? You should get it from somewhere else. And I, I, had, I had actually gotten lucky in my first movie with Lone Survivor. You know, we did really well with that movie. But my version of really well was totally different than the reality. Like in, in private equity or in venture capital, you assume you put money in and you know, you're getting a double or a triple or a 10X or a 100X, or maybe you lose all your money, you don't know. But in the movie business, if you get your money back plus 20%, everyone's like, well done, you know, you got a, you know, A plus. And I just thought that was the most bizarre thing ever. And I think it really came down to, you know, in order to re really make proper money in the movie business, you either have to own the IP um, or you're first out on the waterfall, or you have a better control of how money gets spent in PA. You know, I remember going to a movie and I won't name which one, but um, I went to the premiere of it and it was just the most insane party I've ever seen. And I thought, I'm the one paying for this. And I don't remember approving this. It was sort of a blanket, you know, idea that everybody was going to have big parties and, you know, all the girlfriends of the actors were going to get their hair done on the, you know, on our budget. And it was just like lots of strange things where I just didn't understand where the money was going and um, why it was being spent the way that it was. And so I had to learn pretty quickly how that was going to affect my thought process on how I would invest. And I think like any company, just like in the movie business, don't do it unless you really love the team and love the project. Um, you know, there's no promises in terms of what you're going to make and you'll probably end up with, you know, lawsuits along the way. And you just want to make sure that you really want to get in bed with, uh, with the project before you do it. You know, I have a, a strange one that, you know, pissed me off, but taught me a long lesson, which is, you know, I ended up in a five, maybe seven year lawsuit with some folks that believed that they owned the rights to a movie that they didn't own the rights to. And because of that, I never could make the movie because we were just stuck in court forever. Um, I ended up winning the case, but you know, it cost several million dollars to fight it. And it was just a bunch of people that were ambulance chasers. So that kind of thing um, is incredibly frustrating when it happens and it happens all the time. Um, and IP rights holders, you know, they, they fight tooth and nail for what they believe that they own and people who own it end up in silly lawsuits anyway, no matter what. So I would just make the suggestion on the movie side that you partner up with people that you love, pick projects that you absolutely know you want to hang your hat on. Uh, that's why I've done a lot of movies that are about true stories, because I always believe that those are the ones that resonate the most, with me at least. Um, and you know, everything else is sort of fun along the way, if you get you know, I, I, I thought if I should ask this question, and probably I shouldn't, which is why I will, a very <laughs> sensitive question to yeah. ask in America, OK? Yeah, go. Uh, so Larry David when uh, in Curb Your Enthusiasm, in one of the episodes, you know, obviously is, is amazing, I, I personally think. Uh, so you don't see me. And, and, and uh, many times he criticizes things without even mentioning them. Mm -hmm. He was criticizing Hollywood. We, in, in, and in a way, uh, uh, it's, it's all across, it's everywhere. It's something mm -hmm. that's supposed to be good, but sometimes in America, things go too far and it's a little bit weird. So what, what, if you remember, there was a scene where he was trying to sell his show to Hulu. And he mm -hmm. goes to meet Hulo, and um, and he sees uh, the team is uh, a, a white male who is the head of the team, and then on yep. the couch, on the couch, uh, are sitting one Afro American, one gay uh, 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 lesbian, one uh, gay uh, male, and they're talking to him, and he doesn't say anything about that. He doesn't remark that, and then he talks about this episode. And then they tell him, at the end of the day, they decided not to work with him. So he goes to uh, Netflix 
And then he goes to Netflix and there's again a couch, there's a, 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 a chair. And again, a white male is the head of the team. And then you see just different people, but in the same category. And in a way, and I heard it from a few people in Hollywood. I think I've seen the same episode having to do with college applications, but go ahead. It's an amazing episode. And, and basically it says, you know, uh, uh, it's one thing to do diversification, but if the talent at the end of the day is chosen because of that and not because if somebody's talented, you got a problem. And you see that in many areas, in corporates as well. I hear many times people are, you know, they have the, the, the certain people because of diversification, not necessarily because of their talent, and we get it, the specification is important and we've advanced, but maybe sometimes we go beyond that. Do you think Hollywood has changed to a point where uh, some talents don't get what they should because they're not from the right group or on the contrary, mm -hmm. some people do get the right post not because of their talent or because of that, because that was really what he was criticizing in a way when, when I saw that episode, that's what came to my mind. Maybe it's not, maybe it is from somebody who's hanging there did you see such a change in the industry in the last several years? I'm not so sure how to address that question. I, 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 I'm always caught in the crossfires of what is it like to be a woman in Hollywood? You're like, well, what is it like to be a woman anywhere? What's it like to be a man anywhere? I mean, to me, I don't even think of it. I don't think of it one way or the other. I mean, I suppose the only place that I think about diversity is when I think about international box office and how certain movies are portrayed in other countries where you'll see that a certain topic, it's just not gonna do as well in another country for obvious reasons. Like a US military movie, probably not gonna do that well in another country, you know, cause they don't have the same camaraderie that we might have about, you know, a military movie that we do here. Um, an African-American movie might not do as well in another country, but it might do even better somewhere else. So I'm not sure how to address that other than to say, I think that I've been, personally, I think I've been treated in incredibly fairly in the industry. Um, in fact, I think it's a lot easier to be a woman in the industry than it is not to. I think uh, there's just sort of a lot of support system out there for women being successful in this business. I, I probably can't speak to the other uh, groups of folks that you mentioned in the Larry David episode, but um, I certainly know that uh, there is always a, a push to do what's right. And, you know, the marketing guys kind of know the demographic that they're going after. They know exactly the kind of people that they want to hit. And they're going to find projects that fit that demographic, whatever those projects are. And those, those um, topics and columns uh, change over the decades. And um, you can see that in, in style and you can see that in um, art, and you can see that in fashion, you can see that in movies and, and in politics and in most categories. And when you came to your father, uh, I understand your, your siblings work in the business. They do now, yeah. A very significant business. And you told him that you, you, you're going to do movies. Was he happy with that? Was he saying, what are you talking about? You should be part of the business, next gen, lead the business, or just do whatever you feel like I, with my blessing. You know, um, I think I, I didn't tell him what I was going to do because, quite frankly, I didn't know at the time. I just said I was going to quit. I, I, I basically had a, a mental conversation um, realizing that, you know, I really hate the real estate business, but I love my dad and I would rather have a relationship with my dad than have a relationship with a business. And the two of them couldn't really coexist very well together. I also didn't think I was getting the autonomy that I needed and the creativity that I was craving. And um, that I would rather fail doing something that I really love than, you know, have an easy success road doing something that's not mine, an industry that I don't own, a family business that's not me. Um, you know, my dad's done a great, uh, he's had an extraordinary career and it's, I'm super proud of being, uh, you know, in, in involved in any way in that business, but I do better on my own and it's not just in movies, you know, our, our, uh, investments in our advisory and, and the things that we've worked on are across so many sectors. And so film was sort of the, the seed of that, but that became so much more to where we are today. I mean, it's film was just a starting point. And then when you look at a project back to film, how do you, how do you choose your project? Is it something that you fall in love with and you say, I love it, I'm doing it. I don't care what comes out of it. Or you try to feel would it be a huge success or not so much or 
it's uh it's one of two things i either literally know the project and feel the hair stand up on my arm when i know it and i'm like oh this is going to be good i i know this is going to work or it's with somebody who i just adore working with and so it'll be fun no matter what like the ride will be fun no matter what and you, did you touch other forms of entertainment like broadway or anything beyond film or maybe uh did a lot of film and television done a lot of gaming so on the entertainment side we've invested in, and worked on a lot of gaming companies um a uh, couple years or maybe eight years ago i met a, a really awesome guy named dave anthony who created call of duty Black Ops 1 and 2, and he wanted to leave Activision, and I found him his source of capital, and he since left, started Deviation Games, which is, I think, the largest gaming deal that's ever been done with Sony, and he's building that game right now. Um, Leslie Benzies and I work closely together. Leslie created Grand Theft Auto. Uh, we've been in stealth mode for about five years with 600 employees building uh, a metaverse and game platform called Build a Rocket Boy. We're about to come out with a trailer of that in the fall games and 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 movies have sort of a similar track where there's an incredible amount of development that goes into it um up to the launch point and then there's just a ton of work that goes into maintaining keeping it going and the life cycle of that game um is actually much harder than a movie even because you have to just keep iterating on it and it just sort of lives forever and changes all the time so those are you know big opportunities that end up involving other brands coming into it so you know, some of the investments that we made were always, uh, they were very compartmentalized, right? So if I, if I invested in biotech, it wouldn't talk to FinTech. If I invested in NFTs, it wouldn't talk to blockchain, sorry, it wouldn't talk to, you know, um, entertainment or gaming. But now all of those compartments have just, you know, the, the, the walls in between have bled away and they're all talk to each other. So my gaming companies want to go and talk to the blockchain companies. My blockchain companies want to go and talk to the, entertainment side of things and the entertainment guys want to and it just kind of keeps rolling out from there i mean in fact as funny as this is I, I got a call from a friend of mine uh in january of 2019 and he said i need you to send a documentary crew out to telluride colorado and i said i don't do that you know i, I really don't often do documentaries and i don't have a crew just standing on on the sidelines um and he <laughs> I said, oh, I'll just do it for you because this is a really good friend. And, and you know, I come to find out through the film side of it that uh, the couple that wanted this documented was actually working on the beginning of the antibody test for uh, what we now know as COVID. So I found out about COVID in January of 2019 as a result of that. It wasn't through my medical science background because I don't have one, it was through film. Um, and, you know, I, I called it back. I said, listen, I don't ever want you to pay me for any of this work. I would like to invest in the company. I think what they're building is amazing. And so we bootstrapped a company back then called uh, Kovax. It was myself, Peter Diamandas, and Tony Robbins. And we took that company public in December of last year, building um, vaccines for COVID, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, and cholesterolemia. So all that started because of a movie. It didn't start because of, you know, anything other than that. And it's always good fun stories that happen like that for me. And before we go to all, there's so much more to talk about, but film, what's your favorite film or films? Um, oh, Out of Africa, Map of the Human Heart, uh, and Oshin. I love movies like that. And TV series, which ones are you think? Oh, anything by, by Taylor Sheraton. I think he's so talented. Um, I also like things like Homeland, um, you know, stuff like and, that. You know, the, the, obviously everything changed with time, but the TV world changed crazily throughout the years, right? I mean, we grew up on Dallas and Dynasty. Yeah. And today, they're, they are very extreme in some way. I mean, Game of Thrones with the nudity and, and, and violence and Stranger Things and uh, Squad Game, suddenly you have you know, uh, series from, from Korea that are huge here and Netflix. So that industry has changed dramatically. Throughout yeah. The yeah. I mean, I think that it's become much more international. You know, it's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of local language, uh, film and television that's become accessible all over the world, you know, thanks to platforms like, you know, Netflix and Hulu and Apple, where you can watch it. TV series that was, you know, made in Israel and now it's being remade. You know, Homeland was an, a, originally an Israeli show that became, you know, an American show. 
there's lots of examples of that where it's picked up for a local language or things are made as local language and then remade um, in another country. Um, you know, Squid Game, things like that are all from other places that we might not have ever seen before. You know, 50 years ago, you weren't really likely to be able to see those shows, but now everything is all mashed together and it becomes this wonderful uh, pool of lots of cool content. I think the problem is really being able to find the good stuff because there's just so much out there. And before we go to uh, uh, philanthropy, I'm, I'm, I'm not done with your career because you've done so many different things. Lala laptop. Can you talk about that? Oh, that was a random one. I wanted to make a, you know, I couldn't find a laptop bag that I liked when laptops were like the cool thing to have. Well, they still are the cool thing to have. But like in the beginning of laptops, there was always you're banging it around and carrying a big heavy thing. So I just made one for fun. I was, I just had my first daughter and I think I was bored and being creative. And so we created this laptop bag company and um, sold them all over the world. And, uh, it was, it was a good experience. That was more my brain just running away with me. And then crypto, how did you end up in crypto? Oh, uh, so I was invited to a party at Brock Pierce's house. Um, and I walked in and every single person was just sort of on their computer jamming away. Brock uh, Pierce, you mentioned? Yeah, they were all like, it was most bizarre. It was a group of people that were all tech guys and all you know, crazy. And the energy in the room was really palpable. And I really liked um, I liked that energy. It was a very addictive energy. And uh, a friend of mine um, very kindly explained to me what, you know, Bitcoin was and crypto was and how it works. And, um, and I started to get involved in ICOs in 2017. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing with wallets or anything else. I actually started working with a, with a kid who was really uh, very humble and helpful and helped me you know with all of my questions that were just so stupid because i was just technologically uh and uh crypto ignorant and um he became sort of the person who was my my, my partner in helping me navigate that space you know a couple of years later he actually started talking about these digital things that he was buying and i thought he kind of lost his mind and it turns out he became the largest collector of uh nfts so he was very early in NFTs and started the Museum of Crypto Art. Um, and he's a great friend of mine now. And we're actually working with him and one of his companies to integrate what they're doing in, in the digital museum that he has into what we're doing into one of the metaverse platforms that I'm part of. So that's how I kind of jumped down the crypto rabbit hole, which is a deep and scary hole filled with lots of very exciting, smart, and also uh, often very corrupt people. But it was, uh, it was just fun, a fun ride. It is a fun ride. I love it. Brock Pierce, we did we did a session like this. I did with him. As oh, well. good. He's a Brock funny guy. Several times. And um, going a little bit back to, to 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 film before we go to gaming, VR. Yeah. So, by the way, yesterday we just held a dinner in New York City with an Israeli startup that does sense in the entertainment world. I should probably introduce them to you. Sense but, like uh, smell. Yes. Oh, cool. Yes, something very interesting. Uh, I don't know why I didn't think to mention that to you. But anyway, um, so VR. So VR came uh, in the 70s or whatever, 80s, and, 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 and vanished. Then it came again. Uh, and, you know, with uh, uh, Oculus and everything, I thought we, we reached, and the film, in the films and everything, uh, obviously 3D and all of that. Uh, but... Uh, do you think it's it's changing the world right now? Because it seems like VR didn't really catch yet. I mean, all the films that go on IMAX as well, I, I don't see people rushing to see them in 3D. Uh, maybe Avatar is a different story, of course, but but it doesn't feel like, like, like 3D caught this time. How do you see 3D? How do you see VR? Uh, Oculus. I did, uh, you know, I, I, I put on the, the thing and I went to, I wanted to be scared, really. Uh, and so I had two options, either to talk to my mother-in-law or to try to put the Oculus on and, 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 and let them scare me. And I did the roller coaster thing and I did that. And it didn't scare me. I, I didn't feel like they're there yet, that when I do the roller coaster thing, I, I didn't feel like I was there. So mm -hmm. they're really advanced, but I feel like they still have a little bit more to go. How do you see the VR and 3D and all of that, new, all those new technologies? Do you think now they're here to stay? And they're going, they're getting there. Obviously, you've been involved in, in these worlds and believe in them. 
Um, so, so VR it obviously has gone through a you know vast iteration to technological shift in the last few years, but I, but I really believe that you know the opportunity in VR hasn't even hasn't even touched the surface yet, especially because VR could be something that is incredibly useful in you know healthcare, uh, education, um, virtual advertising, virtual spaces, social commerce. Um, you know, and that is the Web3 ecosystem. I think we just need to get to the point where the hardware and the software is, you know, easy enough to use. I think we're going to end up going the AR route first because it's just more uh, user friendly um, before we AR, end up diving AR. deep into the VR space. AR, AR meaning uh, augmented reality. So, you know, things that you're able to sort of see in front of you using glasses or your phone. Um, before we go into full immersive and get really comfortable with wearing, you know, full immersive experiences. And VR, of course, is virtual yeah. uh, reality. And do you think Oculus are killing it or not yet? I mean, it feels like, you know, when Sony got in and Samsung, I think, got in, it felt like, wow, the big guys are getting into the scene. And yet it somehow feels to me like, you know, the, the excitement was a little bit, you know, take, going down a little bit lately. I mean, it's a it's a it's a tough road, I'm sure, for a lot of these VR companies. But there's a lot of progress that's being made, um, and eventually it'll hit this moment where it becomes something that's, you know, uniquely and easily accessible, and the the use case and the utility of it is undeniable. And that's when it'll hit its. I think so too. I, mean, I, I bought, you know, when uh, when Panasonic had a 3D v, uh, projector, I have it in my house. I bought it, I don't know, seven years ago. They don't make it anymore. Yeah. It was a 3D projector and you had to have a 3D disc and a 3D cable and a 3D, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, everything had to be 3D uh, associated. So you, I really managed to construct it. And by the time I showed it to my kids, they're telling me we get a, we don't feel good after half an hour. So we don't want to watch it. Exactly. You're be kidding me. So, but they are getting there. So you believe we're going to get there and it will change the world. And how I think we we're going to get there. I'm hoping we're going to get there. And um, uh, um, so, so you've been doing so much throughout the years and um, philanthropy. You wanted to get, uh, now we're finally I'm getting to what you do there and what <laughs> you care about. And, and so share with us. Uh, philanthropy. Um, actually, a friend of mine, told me at one point I needed to meet this guy and he was amazing and it would change my life. And I avoided meeting that person for a very, very long time. Uh, and, and then he finally just showed up at my house and he said, listen, I'm going to watch the kids. You need to go and have dinner with this guy and do it right now. And that's how I met Peter Diamandas who started the X prize. And I became a board member shortly thereafter, but we are having a really fun time. And what we do, we solve or try to solve some of the world's biggest problems. We, um, have hundreds of millions of dollars of prizes, um, things like the $100 million Elon Musk Carbon Prize. Uh, we have a prize for rainforests. We have a prize for ocean ecosystems. Um, and we have a prize for avatars. And we do the very best that we can in trying to really captivate the world by coming up with these prizes and then solving them through the networks that we have. And those solutions can come from anywhere in the world, from anyone in the world, and any time in the world. And that's what we're working on. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I'm actually looking at it uh, right now. This is it. Yeah, that's our Rainforest Prize. So it's very, very um, uh, interesting. How long have you been involved in this? Uh, for about five years. About five years? Yeah, about five years. Interesting. And people can donate, uh, uh, obviously, to get involved. Um, so, for example, we'll work with a company um, or in the case of the carbon prize, you know, Elon said he would or is donating $100 million for the winner of that prize. He had a specific problem. He wanted to solve it. Here's the prize pool. Go. So that's how we do it. Amazing. And um, what's next for you? I mean, what, what are the most exciting projects you have on your table right now in film, in tech, in everything around? The one that I'm spending the most time on right now that I'm so excited about is Build a Rocket Boy. That's the one that's kind of under wraps in stealth mode and we are 
heads down, grinding away towards when we reveal uh, the trailer, which will be in a couple of weeks in bringing in some of the biggest partners and content and fashion and music uh, in the world to join us in our launch. That's been, that's probably the most exciting one for me. Like that's an unstoppable uh, joy that I have in, in working with that team. They're really great. And what was the, the, the project that most excited you I, that you that whenever you think about you, you you loved it more than anything else any film that you think that was your best project to date and that you really loved more than anything else you know i actually i love uh i i really love the lone survivor experience because it was my first one where i really didn't know what i was doing i mean i love i love moments that i remember where they were doing a shot and it's the scene in the movie if you've seen it where he's just tumbling down the hill and he's just getting beat up again and again and again and they shot that all in one take. Uh, and the stunt double was like, I'm just gonna do it all in one take. And he did, and I think he broke a couple of ribs and then they called it for the day and that was it. And it was a bad idea, but it was very fun to see that all come together as well as it did. I really loved doing that. And I loved, uh, I loved Rocket Man because I love Elton and I love sort of musical fun and joy and happiness and a story that's true that goes along the way. Um, I'm working on a couple of, you know, fun little uh, documentaries right now, one on, finding Satoshi um, and then uh, hopefully knock on wood if uh, I get to be part of it we'll do um, the next uh, version of Crazy Rich Asians which is called oh. Christianity so I'm hoping I'm hoping to work on that one we'll see what happens and tell me why, why don't we see uh, first of all I think some families you know you know many families like to work with other families because unlike uh, I don't know KKR there's nobody who's taking a coupon on whatever happens whether you lost or won you know they're in the same boat yeah <laughs> if i'm good at real estate join me on a real estate deal if you know how to navigate film maybe I'll yeah. Do a film deal. yeah yeah yeah, so, yeah do you see co-investing like that do you see other families that would say lauren knows what she's doing we, we want to be uh diversified you want to be in film lauren when you have a, a good project let, let us in do you do that do you work with other families like that so the answer is uh, the answer is yes and no uh, the answer is quite specific in that I don't uh, particularly like managing other people's money. It kind of freaks me out. I've only done that one or two times with people. Um, and and I find that I'm not running a fund. I'm, I'm doing investments for my own sake. And every once in a while, I'll, I'll do it for somebody else. Um, I'm always happy to see a deal and call a friend and be like, you got to look at this one. It's really amazing. And then they can go their merry way and do it. But um it just takes a lot of work to button up deals if you're having somebody else compile it on your SPV and and you know it's just a lot of responsibility that maybe I'm not so excited maybe that's about. connected maybe that's connected to what you say but why don't we see maybe I'm wrong and we do see funds that are you know investing in Broadway shows or in film and you know where they have an advisory board of people like yourself that know how to navigate that space. I don't see that too much happening uh, to allow other families, you know, to get some exposure to, to this world through a fund or through something like that. You don't see that too much. You know, I think it exists. I just don't think that people talk about it that much. Like when you look at, um, you know, the biggest studios in the world are often funded by people you never hear about. Just not talked about um, until it becomes problematic. <laughs> so hopefully it doesn't. But I mean, if you look at uh, you know some of the original forces behind Hollywood, it was a bunch of friends getting together and they put up money, and then the studios kind of took over, and the studios are the ones that put up money. But like, I I I think that you know the projects that end up going out there into the world that they become accessible to everybody are probably not the good projects anymore. No no different than like if there's a deal out there that hasn't been swooped up really quickly, people go, well, is it really a good deal? In, in no in every industry so there's a bit of that like, and are quiet there, force are there any uh, genres that are that, that, that are more profitable than others like for instance when people talk about horror films they talk about films that are usually very low to produce and there are lots of people that want to see them so the risk is lower i don't know if that's true or not but you know and of course there are groundbreaking films like blair witch like paranormal mm -hmm. activities that you know, all these found footage films. I mean, there are different kinds of films that managed to have very low, uh, 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 you know, investment and were highly profitable. Do you, is, does that exist? I mean, other genres that, that probably would be less risky because 
the audience is, 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 is pretty large and the investment is pretty low. So your risks are- I think it kind of depends on who, on, on who you're involved within those projects. I mean, horror is a perfect example, right? I don't particularly li like watching horror movies and I don't really like making them, but um, there was one movie in particular that needed some help. And I brought in a great friend of mine, Sam Raimi, who's an exceptional uh, horror director. And he came in to help produce it. And we made a movie called Crawl, which is a really, you know, it did really well at the box office. And it's just one of those typical horror movies. It didn't cost that much, but it, like it's got those avid fans that want to go into the movie theater and go, oh my God, and freak out. And so I love that, but I would not have done that if I didn't get to do it with Sam. That wouldn't have been something I would have picked. I wouldn't have been like, oh, let's definitely go do this movie. That's not one that I would have wanted to spend my time in doing, but um, because it was him, I went for it. So I have to tell you, I'm a big horror fan. Sam uh, uh, Raimi is a huge name. I mean, I don't know if you've seen right. Evil Dead. I mean, obviously he ended up doing uh, blockbusters. Mm -hmm. But when he started with Evil Dead, I don't know if you've seen that. That's one of the most hilarious uh, and, and groundbreaking horror films. Yeah. Amazing. And Sam Sam was one of the most exceptional people I've ever met. He really is a great guy. Yeah. He's a great, he's a great, great human, great director, great friend, great father. He's just a great guy all around. So right now you're still obviously involved in film. You're still looking at technology that's associated mm -hmm. uh, with that. Um, any other segments of technology that you're looking into? I mean, you're, you mentioned obviously things that are around your world, uh, crypto, anything else that you're looking at in, in, in technology? Uh, lots in gaming and the support systems for that. A lot of things in the NFT Web3 space, um, a few things in the biotech space, which are fun. Um, there really isn't a category we don't touch except for politics. What about gaming? What's going on in gaming? What's going on in the gaming world? Play to earn, awesome. Gaming is super fun. I'm involved in a fund called One Up, which was started by Ed Freeze, who created Xbox. Um, I'm an early investor in companies like Animoca, which have Sandbox and other play to earn games. Um, uh, obviously, I've got the uh, Deviation Games with Dave Anthony and the game that sits within Build a Rocket Boy uh, called Everywhere with Leslie Benzies. And um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the gaming space is kind of bananas. I, I wish I knew more about it from the play to earn side, but that's for my more literate crypto folks to help me understand. I mean, can you explain why a, a game like Fortnite just takes over everybody? I mean, my kids spend so much money no on idea. things, skins. But yeah, really I mean, I own virtual shoes that are more expensive than my real shoes. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. So, um, uh, amazing. So I, I think we, we covered pretty much uh, your, your exciting journey. So real estate right now, you're not involved at all. That's it. Um, only when I'm needed, if, you know, my dad has a favor. I'm happy to comply, but I try to stay away from the real estate side of things. You're, you're, you're in a, at a more exciting uh, world, it seems to me. Uh, and uh, there's only so much you can do within four walls. And, uh, and, and, and you won awards, your, your projects won awards, and this really doesn't happen too much. I've seen so many families that dived into this world just because it's fun and failed, and very few stories like that. Actually, one of our, of our good friends, uh, Wendy Fetterman, uh, I don't know if you met her at our conferences, but she's in a, her family business was completely different story. I think they were dealing with uh, storage, something that, you know, it doesn't get more boring than that. Yeah. Or maybe it does, insurance, but that's it. And, and when they sold the business, she went into Broadway and everybody told her, you've got to be out of your mind. The risk is, is phenomenal. Yeah. Today, she's one of the most successful producers. Uh, yeah, she's great. Right. And, and I was lucky enough to-, uh, to Oh, meet you know her. her? Yeah, I met her, I think, wasn't, I think I met her in Miami, no? Yeah, she wasn't on Miami. Miami. Yeah, that was it. First of all, uh, I'd like to share that uh, I, I managed to run after you enough to convince you to, to join our UAE <laughs> conference. And hopefully yes. events. By the way, live live entertainment is fun. So we did talk about that, but we're oh, doing yeah. a live entertainment space in Dubai. I have advised a company called Thinkwell, which is now owned by Tate. Uh, they built the Harry Potter theme park in London, the Warner Brothers theme park in Abu Dhabi, the expos that are over there. Uh, my friend uh, over at Hype Space is building a giant NFT uh, physical gallery over in Dubai. So. There's a lot of stuff coming out in the crypto space in that region, and it's really exciting. And we did a bunch of activations, live activations in Saudi 
Um, we did the Toy Fest, the uh, Hot the Hot Wheels Loop Track. We did we redid Comic Con over there, the Stanley Supercon. So there's been a lot of really you know exciting live entertainment things that have happened as well. Um, we actually did do Broadway technically. We did Broadway over in Saudi, but that's not that's you, not the real Broadway. How do you see the UAE uh, in this space beyond? Uh, obviously, they have some of the most amazing parks uh, uh, out there uh, in, in in the UAE and live entertainment. How do you see them investing in the film industry? I mean, uh, do you see investments from the UAE in the film industry in Hollywood and and in different? Oh, parts? they they very they very much want to get involved in Hollywood. I think anybody who's a celebrity is considered like the sexy person on earth over there, and they're always calling and saying, "Hey, can you bring over, you know, so and so, <laughs> you know, please bring over this celebrity or that celebrity." And I'm like, it's not really what I do, but you know, Hollywood's sexy. People like it. They never seem to stop. Yes, so de definitely that's an interesting market for us. We're doing our first conference in the UAE uh, in, in January. Uh, right. And you'll be coming and Sherry Blair and many other uh, very cool names. Right. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been, uh, I really appreciate the fact that, you, that, 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 that we managed to do this talk. I know you don't do those things normally. And so- uh, I don't, but I'm happy to do it for you. And I'm, I'm thrilled that I was able to, you know, speak to whatever it is that might or might not be exciting to your little audience here. And uh, if there's anything I can do, let me know. Yeah. Anything, Any, to get together. anything else you'd like to add um, at all? You know, do, do what you love. If we haven't. If life's too short. Do what you love. Always. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, I, I, I really want to thank you for your time. It's been a, an exciting uh, discussion yeah. you have a very uh, uh, interesting career that you must be very proud of and you don't seem bored so uh <laughs> seems like you're having fun yeah there's never been... bored there's never boredom in this world there's never never a never a quiet day beautiful so uh i'm looking forward to seeing you in person yeah at our next events and meet more great families and thank you lauren for sharing with us uh thank you thank you guys story. appreciate everybody's time Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.